Let us pray. May I speak in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. These are tough texts this morning, challenging us to love our enemies. And not just in a superficial way, but in profound ways that are, I would say, almost disturbing. Let me read from the words of Jesus. Did he really say that? This is from Luke chapter 6, verses 27 following. But I say to you that, listen, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who abuse you. If anyone strikes you on the cheek, offer the other also. And from anyone who takes away your coat, do not withhold even your shirt. Give to everyone who begs from you. And if anyone takes away your goods, do not ask for them again. Do to others as you would have them do to you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those whom you hope to receive from, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love your enemies. Do good and lend, expecting nothing in return. Your reward will be great, and you will be children of the Most High. For he is kind to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, will be put into your lap. For the measure you give will be the measure you get back. Love your enemies, but what do we do when it gets complicated? The second scripture assigned by the lectionary is from Psalm 37. That one's even worse. Do not fret because of the wicked. Do not be envious of wrongdoers, for they will soon fade like the grass and wither like the green herb. Trust in the Lord and do good, so you will live in the land and enjoy security. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him and he will act. He will make your vindication shine like the light and the justice of your cause like the noonday. Be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret over those who prosper in their way, over those who carry out evil devices. Refrain from anger and forsake wrath. Do not fret. It leads only to evil. For the wicked shall be cut off. But those who wait for the Lord shall inherit the land. Yet a little while, and the wicked will be no more. Though you look diligently for their place, they will not be there. But the meek will inherit the land and delight themselves in abundant prosperity. And then I read also from verse 24 to 25. Though we stumble, we shall not fall headlong, for the Lord holds us by the hand. I have been young and now am old, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken 
all their children begging for bread. And then I go to the end of the psalm, verses 39 to 40. The salvation of the righteous is from the Lord. He is their refuge in the time of trouble. The Lord helps them and rescues them. He rescues them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in him. Are we really supposed to do that? Have you ever tried that? Who has? Is this realistic? What we find um, in Jesus' sermon that he preaches is just a snapshot of Jesus' broader teaching about love and only a very small snapshot of the wider teaching of the Bible about how we should love others. And actually, loving others is far more complex, far more challenging, and far more interesting that we often allow it to be when we preach on texts like this. In Jesus' sermon, this is actually an excerpt of a sermon, the so-called Sermon on the Plain, in the Gospel of Luke in chapter 6, which is a sister sermon to the so-called Sermon on the Mount, which is in Matthew chapter 5 to 7. In this sermon, Jesus in, uh, addresses just one particular issue, namely how we should interact with other people who are enemies to us personally. Too often, I believe, in the preaching and teaching of the church, these statements of Jesus have been broadened to a point where other really important parts of Scripture have been neglected. And I will try and show us what these other parts of Scripture are and how they can broaden the ways in which we can love others in ways that are truly uh, constructive and liberating and healing, both for the enemies, but also for others and for ourselves. The other scripture, Psalm 37, I find personally even more difficult because this psalm unrelentingly trusts in God. Well, I'm a pastor, I'm ordained in the Methodist Church, maybe I shouldn't be saying this. But <laughs> this psalm unrelentingly believes that if we and others in the world are being mistreated, even systematically abused, then somehow, if we wait long enough, God will somehow intervene, judge and punish the wicked, and save and rescue us and heal us. Now, I wonder if I asked every one of us here in this congregation uh, whether you have experienced that in your life. I trust and I'm relatively confident that there is actually quite a few of us who can say that. But I bet you that there are also some of us here in this congregation and anywhere else in the world today who will say, no, I have not experienced that yet. Maybe they will say, I have not experienced that yet but I'm still hoping. Others may say, I've been in this for so long, I've given up all hope. So what are we supposed to do with these scriptures? I think the most important thing to do is to put them into a broader perspective. And I want to begin really, first of all, to put Jesus' own ministry and life into a broader perspective. 
often the way Jesus is portrayed in the church is that is as if he is some kind of meek and mild guy who constantly yields before others and offers the other cheek and lets them beat, up, beat him up. But if we actually look at Jesus' life, what we read mainly about in the Gospels, of course, is the last three years of his life. And then we encounter him constantly stirring up trouble. Jesus was actually a systematic troublemaker. Have you ever noticed this? It is not until the very last week of his life that becomes meek and mild because he goes to the cross like a lamb to the slaughter without fighting back. And that is the great example of Jesus. But that's not the only part of his life. For the other three years that are recorded in, in the Gospels, he constantly picks fights. And he picks fights with the powerful and the religious leaders of his day, especially he picks on the hypocrites. Have you noticed, for example, his wicked sense of humor? The guy had a furbler for camel jokes. First, there is that uh, joke about the rich. He says, uh, it's easier for a camel to go through the, eel of a ni uh, 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 the eye of a needle than for a rich person to get into heaven. For heaven's sake, that's a joke. It's a camel joke. Then he talks to the Pharisees and he says, you hypocrites! I'm not quite sure whether he used that tone. He had probably much stronger tone than me here, but no microphone. Um, but he says, you hypocrites, you who sieve out a gnat from the drinks you drink, and then you swallow a camel. That's another camel joke. Now, I believe, actually, he probably had dozens of these. We only get two of these related in the Gospels. The other thing that we see is Jesus has some bitingly sarcastic and strongly aggressive words about the wicked. Let me share this with you. This is from the very same sermon, uh, the Sermon on the Plain in Luke chapter 6. He uh, begins with a series of blessings very similar to the sister sermon uh, in Matthew, where in chapter 5 it begins with those beautiful beatitudes. But here in the Gospel of Luke, in the Sermon on the Plain, even the beatitudes have a little bit of an edge to them, and then they smoothly move into a series of curses. Listen to this. Then he looked at his disciples, this is the beginning of the sermon, and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry. Blessed are you who weep now. Blessed are you when people hate you, and so on. And then he goes into, but woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now. And so it goes on. If I may be allowed to jump back into the Sermon on the Mount, there is another very interesting teaching that Jesus shares with his disciples. And he says, when you are on your way to the temple and you find that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there and go straight back and meet that person and make it up with them. Because otherwise they will send you to prison and you will not be let out of prison until you have paid the last dime. I don't think he used dime, but you know what I mean. You know what I mean. Um, overwhelmingly, this passage is preached in a way that we are supposed to hear Jesus says, when people mistreat us, let us be reconciled with them and then come to God and pray. 
But that is not what Jesus is saying. Did you hear? What Jesus is actually talking about, he, he is not, not talking to uh, the victim of a crime. He is talking to the perpetrator of the crime. He is talking to the criminal. And we know it's a criminal because Jesus tells that guy, if you don't sort yourself out, you will end up in prison. So Jesus here is actually talking to the criminal, to the cruel person, to the enemy, to the bad guy, to the wicked. And Jesus is saying to the wicked, you better sort yourself out, not only with God, but also with your neighbor. And so what we see is when we look at the whole life of Jesus, then his challenge to love your enemy is only a snapshot of what the whole teaching of Jesus is about. I now want to bring in one or two other scriptures as we begin to think about how can we apply this broader understanding of loving our enemies to uh, Jesus' invitation to us today. First, of course, Jesus does not only say, love your enemies. His teaching on love is far more profound, I believe. Because when he is asked by yet another Pharisee, uh, what is the greatest commandment? Jesus kind of gives two answers. Love your God and love your neighbor as yourself. And when we bring these two teachings of Jesus together, it gets a little bit more complicated. We suddenly realize that neither was Jesus a doormat that let other people walk all over him, neither does he want us to be doormats and let other people walk all over us or walk all over those other neighbors whom we are supposed to love. There is an, an urgent edge to Jesus' teaching on love where when we really take him seriously to love our neighbor as ourselves, we may be also called to love our enemies to such an extent that we stop them from harming others. And we find this in Scripture throughout. I want to share one or two passages now from the Old Testament again that help us understand this in a more profound way. The first one is from Isaiah in chapter 1. Um, I could, of course, preach for three or four hours on Isaiah alone, but I won't. But in chapter 1 of Isaiah, this is the first part of the book of Isaiah, 1 to 39, Isaiah constantly attacks the king and the people as a whole. This is God's own people, the Israelites. If we apply that for us today, God, uh, I, the, I, the pro God through the prophet, is talking to the church today. And he is accusing us, including our leaders and our normal people in every congregation, of doing something wrong. And this is what he is saying. Chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice. Rescue the oppressed. Defend the orphan. Plead for the widow. I don't know whether you picked this up. This is a very interesting passage. Let me just read it again. Cease to do evil. Learn to do good. Seek justice, rescue the oppressed, defend the orphan, and plead for the widow. This is a fascinating challenge to us today from God's word. Yes, we are supposed to love our enemies, but then also, we are not only not to do evil, but we are also called to learn to do good. 
And learning to do good is here uh, exemplified through statements like rescuing the oppressed, pleading for, supporting the widow and the orphan. People who cannot help themselves out of the trouble that they find themselves in because of their enemies. And so I believe the challenge to God's church today, not only to us, every one of us as individuals, but to the church as a whole, is to be more committed to the issues of social justice. We are not only called to love our enemies, but we are also called to love our neighbors as ourselves. And we cannot do that if we constantly yield before wickedness and evil in this world. Let me share with you another scripture. This helps us perhaps even more to understand who we are called to be. This is from the book of Proverbs in chapter 25, verse 26. It's a rather clever proverb. And I, to be honest, I, I'm an Old Testament scholar. I did my PhD on the book of Proverbs. I didn't get what this proverb says until 20 years into my studies. Since then, it sometimes keeps me awake at night. Listen to this. Hopefully you get it quicker than I did. Like a muddied spring or a polluted fountain are the righteous who give way before the wicked. Again. Like a muddy spring or a polluted fountain are the righteous who give way before the wicked. Now this proverb envisages us as the righteous, and rightly so, because we have been justified by grace through Jesus. We are Christians and we want to live good lives and Overall, we are not doing too badly. We are not so bad at avoiding to do bad things. But as the righteous, we are not just supposed to be righteous for ourselves. We also have not only a duty, hear me right, not only a duty, but much more a privilege. After having been given so much from God through Jesus and God's love to us. We also have a privilege, as we prayed in our prayer during our offering, to give something back to God and to give something back to our fellow human beings. As the righteous, as Christians, we are called to be springs and fountains. We are called to be channels of the water of life. We are called to be, we are recreated to be a source of happiness, of goodness, of joy, of laughter, of hope for other people around us. Not only us as individuals, but the church as a whole. Yet, this proverb says, if we give way before the wicked, we become a muddied spring and a polluted fountain. We lose that life-giving power that we are supposed to have as ambassadors for Christ here on earth. What does all of that mean for us today, for you and me, but also for the church as a whole? In case you're wondering, we're coming to the end of the sermon. We're not quite there yet, but I am, I am on the last, uh, last lap. So kind of ringing the bell. Um, so those of you who are h half asleep by now, it's worth waking up again, okay? So what does this mean for us today? I think the first thing we need to realize is that... Um, in sermons like this, the danger is that we fall into a new kind of legalism. 
as if we were the only hands and feet of God. As if, if we don't do it, no one else will do it. There is something profound about Psalm 37, namely this, that God commits himself in his word to do something about the wicked and to rescue the oppressed. So I think you and I, we are called urgently with conviction to pray. And I don't mean your meek and mild sort of prayer. I mean fear of God kind of prayer. That God will intervene in the thick and thin of people's lives, especially where they are systematically and uh, in a prolonged way mistreated. Secondly, as we are called not to give way before the wicked, we need to realize you and I, we are not in this on our own. Did you realize that the Christian church, you know, we are not just like our United Methodist Church here. We are part of a much bigger body of people. The Christian church is not only the largest religion on earth, but we are actually the largest human organization on earth. Not only that, we have been around for 2,000 years. We are the longest in existence organization this world has ever seen. We are globally networked vertically and horizontally. We have a church in every den of hell on earth. When Jesus calls Peter and, and changes his name and says, you are the rock and on this rock I will build my church. We, we are not called to be a, a wet blanket. We are called to be a rock, a rock for justice. And this isn't just empty words, or I'm trying to put words into Jesus' mouth. But listen to what Jesus says next. He says, On this rock I will build my church, and now wait for it, and the gates of hell will not be able to withstand it. We sometimes think in the church as if we were some kind of beleaguered minority persecuted by this, that, and the other, whatever. No. We are not only called to be, but we are equipped to be by Jesus and through the power of the Holy Spirit to be on the offensive. We are called to attack the gates of hell. And the gates of hell are on this earth. And the people who walk through it, they will end there. But we have a chance to love our enemies to the point where we stop them from doing what they're doing, call them to repentance to God as we stand up for our neighbors and love them as we love ours and their neighbors in the name of Christ. So I want to just encourage us this morning to rediscover just how fortunate we are as we are part of God's movement of love in this earth. You know, when you gave your offering here this morning, you weren't just paying your pastors and your other full-time staff here. You were marching on the gates of hell because the money you give, the church uses to stand up for the oppressed and the widow and the orphan. When you pray, you are praying to the most powerful entity in the universe. This God not only created this earth, he even raised Jesus from the dead. This God has immense power 
And he loves all of us, including the most unfortunate human beings on earth, limitlessly. So I want to say to us this morning, as we read these scriptures, that there is a so much broader teaching in the Bible of what it means to love. And that love does not mean that we are doormats. It doesn't mean that we are wet blankets. It means that we are warriors on behalf of the less fortunate. We are not just called to love our enemies. We are also called to love our neighbors, trusting that God will make fruitful our efforts both as individuals, but also of us as parts of God's wider church. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Amen. Can I, yeah, great. Can I hear another louder amen? <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen.